Thank you for coming tonight. We're going to talk to you about um, the South Shore Hospital Total Joint Replacement Program that we have here. Um, we offer it to people just thinking about maybe having a joint replacement or what is our program like or maybe you've had a joint replacement in the past or maybe you have a friend or family member that's in need of a joint replacement. So there's a group of us that are going to take turns talking about the different phases of coming in and having a joint replacement um, and hopefully you get a good understanding of what we do here at South Shore Hospital. Okay? So to start it off, Dr. Ayers is going to talk. He's one of our orthopedic surgeons and he'll kind of talk about who he is and what he does and then we'll kind of all take turns. Okay? So, uh, welcome. My name is Dr. Michael Ayers. I'm um, one of the orthopedic surgeons here at South Shore Hospital. I specialize in joint replacement. Uh, I've been at the hospital since about 2002, and my practice is pretty much based uh, most on hip and knee replacement. Um, at a community hospital, we also sort of do a little bit of trauma, so there's a little bit of that mixed in. Uh, so that's sort of a little bit about me. Um, there's a number of others of my partners downstairs at South Shore Orthopedics that also do joint replacement. We all kind of work together in a program and Alicia is the uh, nurse navigator of the program and basically the boss and we've got some uh, therapists and nurses here all that kind of talk to you about what we do. What we do is we try and do a really good job helping folks that need hip replacement or knee replacement surgery or shoulder replacement surgery kind of get through that process in the best way possible, hopefully get to a good result and uh, do it sort of in an informed and um, hopefully, I wouldn't say it's enjoyable, but at least a productive way. So. Um, we're going to start basically with talking a little bit about arthritis. Arthritis is basically wear of a joint, and um, the joints are, are bones that are covered in the ends with cartilage. The cartilage offers a kind of a cushioned and gliding surface that allow our joints to move, and that these joints can wear, and, and sometimes they wear because there's damage, sometimes they wear because of some disease processes like rheumatoid arthritis. Most of the time they wear by a combination of uh, a little bit of wear and tear, maybe some athletic injuries or minor traumas, and a lot of genetics. Some people have really good cartilage and they get to be 102 and never have any problems with their joints, and some people's joints start to have problems in their 20s and 30s, and we don't totally understand that. Probably someday we will understand it and we'll be able to intervene earlier, but at this point we usually don't notice arthritis until it's sort of a little bit advanced uh, down the road. Uh, so it's pretty prevalent. One in five adults are affected with arthritis. Uh, it's degenerative. And the thing about arthritis is usually by the time we figure out what's going on with it, with it and, and get an x-ray that shows arthritis, particularly if it is that kind of more wear and tear variety, we can pretty much know that it's not going to get better on its own. As a disease, this process gets worse. It's progressive. Uh, we don't know whether it's going to get worse quickly or slowly, but we know that it's going to get worse. So treatment of joint pain. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that we do before therapy. In fact, most of what we do is treat people without surgery. Um, it's kind of a, a misnomer to say we're surgeons because we might do surgery one or one and a half days a week and the rest of the week we're treating people in the office and usually treating them conservatively. So what is conservative treatment? Well, uh, usually there are many things that can help and some of them listed here are physical therapy, pain relievers, weight loss, uh, injections. We can inject a few things in the knee. We can inject cortisone, which is a steroid. We can inject some gel products that are usually molecules that, that are the building blocks of cartilage that we inject into the joint, just the knee joint mostly. Uh, those provide pain relief. They don't really do much else. There are some misnomers that some things will regrow cartilage and, and all these things. Um, none of that's really been, been borne out to be true. Uh, if, you, if you like to read the newspaper or, or various things on TV, there are some newer injections. There's a whole field called regenerative medicine. There's a lot of things that can be injected. Um, there have been some problems with those in, in different areas with the injections, and it's sort of a, a new Wild West kind of a field. None of it's really proven in science. 
And um, what I tell people is if, if you're interested in it and you have the money, there's no real harm in trying it as long as it's a, it's a proved product, but there's no real proof that any of that, that stuff does much uh, to really make it better. Um, arthroscopic surgery can be very helpful in certain cases. As a joint wears out, there can be pieces of cartilage that float around. They can get caught and stuck in the knee and cause locking, clicking, and catching. And arthros arthroscopic surgery is a way to, um, to, to, to basically to fix that and uh, sometimes can be quite helpful in the process. So um, the big thing about conservative therapy is usually it's a regimen of things that people do together that does it. Not one of these things work, but when you do a number of things together, that's when you get the best benefit. And then, of course, uh, joint replacement surgery is kind of what, what people are here to hear a little bit about today. Um, so when you get to that point where you've sort of had treatment with your arthritis, you're having injections and um, the pain becomes uh, what I'd like to call something that really interferes with your lifestyle. So it's something that's there every day. It might affect your sleep. When you're not sleep well, then the wheels kind of come off the cart usually. A lot of other things don't go well when people aren't sleeping well. Um, you know, you can't go uh, get the mail without pain. You can't walk the dog. Sort of these normal life activities you can't do anymore. That's kind of when, um, that's when people usually come see us and then we will go over that, that sort of regimen conservative treatment. We like to make sure people combine exercises with medications, uh, with some injection therapy. And, and what we try to do is get people who are in pain at a point when they're sort of on a plateau. They're doing better with these conservative treatments. And that might go for a while and then inevitably that stops working. That's usually the time when we'll have a more serious conversation about the, the larger interventions of joint replacement. So usually it's that point where it's a consult with the surgeon. A lot of times it's someone that I've seen for many years, but also there's plenty of times where people don't get treatment and they go and see their primary care doctor and they have a horrible x-ray and they need a joint replacement then. And those are usually more when you meet someone for the first time and they already have bad arthritis and we might talk about a joint replacement. But usually the, the, the consult is the first time we go over, we try and put the pieces together of what's going on with the patient and, and kind of discuss options. So what is a joint replacement? Well, it depends and they're a little bit different. So we'll start with um, what we see there is a knee replacement, two knee replacements, and a hip replacement. Um, in general, the, the implants replace the damaged uh, bone surfaces. So the cartilage has worn out uh, and it needs to be replaced with something. And it's usually replaced with a combination of materials. Uh, when we see the white stuff, that's plastic, but it's not really plastic. It's, it's a, a very fancy, expensive uh, polyethylene. And the metal, when you see the metal, if it's a shiny metal on top of a plastic, that's usually a hard metal like a cobalt chrome. And then where the metal attaches to the bone, so this goes down into the bone, this metal here would be a titanium because titanium is really, um, uh, bone and titanium like each other. So bone tends to grow onto titanium and titanium is actually a little bit of a softer metal so it actually moves with the bone a little bit more. So that's just a little bit about those, and they um, obviously we the goals are to, re to relieve pain and to restore mobility. The decision for joint replacement uh, is just that it's a decision, and um, I think one of the key things to to understand here is that the joint replacement surgery is elective. Um, a patient elects to have a joint replaced, so usually a surgeon has a discussion about all options, and we get to the point where this is a this is a possible option, and the patient decides that that they like to do that. That obviously involves uh, understanding what's involved, understanding the recovery, understanding the risks and the benefits, and that interchange leads to the point of a decision. And once that decision is made, um, you know, we, we will talk about some things, um, some of which might be patient factors. Um, I have a lot of talk with people these days about modifiable risk factors. Um, surgery is risky, and we can actually modify some things uh, with the surgery. So if people smoke, we usually tell, tell them about quitting smoking. Smoking affects your your vasculature, your microvasculature, it affects your skin healing. Um, if your skin doesn't heal and you get an infection and you get your joint infected, you're in big trouble. So we usually will we'll have a serious discussion about people about stopping smoking before their, their joint replacement. Um, we talk about weight loss before surgery. Well, weight loss preparing for surgery is also something that's important because again, people who tend to um, obesity and, and high body mass index can lead to complications in surgery. So we have these kind of conversations in preparing for surgery. And sometimes we may need to delay, delay surgery a little bit for some kind of preparation. Um, medical preparations, heart disease, lung disease, all things have to be sort of optimized so that we, we get the best results from the surgery. And then once we kind of get there, we, we kind of go over and uh, we have a handbook that kind of just details a lot of the particulars about surgery. 
Um, we have a, a wonderful uh, joint replacement class, which um, goes over the types of stuff we're talking about tonight, but much more in depth about the whole process. Um, usually the primary care doctor is involved, at least in, in being aware of the surgery, depending on the patient's medical condition, there may be more or, mess, more or less involvement and uh, preoperative testing or evaluations that need to be, be done. Um, Usually you're going to have some form of anesthesia for the surgery. It's hard to do it without it, so there's a, there's a pre-op clearance with the anesthesia that gives you a phone call. Um, we also do some screening. MRSA is a, um, a screening of the nares, so the inside of your nose for uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, which is a bacteria that a good percentage of population is colonized with. It's not something that bothers anybody, but if people have that colonization, they might be at a small risk of infection. So if people have that, we test for it, and we will give them an ointment to put in their nose for about five or seven days to sort of treat that beforehand. So as you can see, we're kind of we're kind of you know very prepared in doing this. We 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 want to make sure that patients prepared and we're prepared, and everything we do gets the patient a good result. Um, this is just kind of an example of a uh, normal joint on your um, on your left. And then as you can see um, in the middle here, what happens, the normal joint is bone and then there's this white cartilage that covers it. And that cartilage is sort of like the shock absorber in a car. So as you're going down the road walking, each step you take this force that's generated and that force is dissipated in the cartilage. Cartilage is the tissue that actually holds water. So think about a sponge. <clears throat> it, it has basically water is in the material and as you walk, that cartilage will flex a little bit and actually absorb force, the same way shock absorbers absorb force going down the road in the car. I don't think it's been a common occurrence in years, but people's shock absorbers used to go in their car and then their car would be kind of frame on frame and it would bounce really hard and it would make noise and it's kind of what happens in the joint. Once that cushion wears out, <coughs> um, all of that force, instead of being dissipated, it gets transmitted to the bone. The bone is a living tissue and <coughs> If you push on living tissue, usually the tissue will respond. If you're going to the gym and lifting weights, your muscles will get bigger. If you push on bones, the bones actually get bigger on the edges. So what happens is the bones get these bumps on them. We call them spurs or osteophytes. As they get bigger and bigger, they push out and these ligaments stay the same length. So basically it's like putting a bigger and bigger amount of material on the same size bag. It gets tighter. So one of the <coughs> you know, symptoms of arthritis is actually joint stiffness, and that's due usually to those osteophytes. So we get stiffness and pain, and those are the, the, the major symptoms of um, the arthritis. Now in the knee, what we end up doing, as you can see here, this is a knee replacement, the bone gets cut right at the top. So these bone spurs get taken off, and a little bit of the, the top layer of the bone comes off, and then this metal device goes down into the bottom part of the tibia. On the femur part, we'll see a side view at some point, there's a, it's basically a cap that caps the end of this bone. So we cut these worn surfaces off and we put a cap on them and then we put a little button underneath the, the kneecap. The hip's a little bit different in that um, we're basically removing the whole ball. Instead of just taking the top part off, we just take the whole ball out and then the stem goes down inside the femur. We have a cup that goes up into the pelvis and they're joined by usually a polyethylene liner. And for the most part now we don't use metal but we use a ceramic material for the head. Um, and for whatever reason, I don't know, the ceramic is always pink. Um, we said shoulder replacements less common. Um, why, why are shoulder replacements less common? Does anyone know? We don't walk on our hands. So um, less common, you get arthritis of the shoulder, but it just doesn't hurt as much because it's, it's, uh, it's not really a load-bearing joint unless they're in cases of, of heavy labor. So, um, but similarly, you get these big, same type of thing, the cartilage wears out, there's a reaction to the joint, and you get these bone spurs. So, um, shoulder replacements come in two varieties. Um, this is a more standard type of shoulder replacement, which is a ball that goes down into the humerus bone, and then a little dish of polyethylene on the, this is the shoulder blade side. This works for people who have intact rotator cuffs. A few years ago, um, this was a newer design probably 10 years ago where um, people who didn't have rotator cuffs who had bad rotator cuff damage were actually in a bit of trouble because there really wasn't a good option for them when they got bad arthritis. But the reverse shoulder replacement, it's called the reverse because the ball goes on the top and the, the dish goes on the bottom. This mechanism allows for function without a rotator cuff. So kind of two varieties of shoulder replacements that we have today. 
So basically, um, roughly your shoulder placement at Sasha Hospital. Uh, there are 13 of us uh, at, uh, uh, who, who are at South Shore Orthopedics. Uh, we work with 11 physicians assistants, physician assistants. We did just about 700 joint replacements in 2018. Your length of stay is, um, I'd say, probably between one and three days. Um, you know, it used to be, joint replacement stays have been going down and down. Um, it's actually a, a, an outpatient surgery for probably 20 to 30 percent of patients across the country. We're not quite there yet, but it's, it's kind of creeping that way. Um, and at least 80 percent, sometimes upwards to 90 percent of patients are going to end up going home. Now, there are various services that people get in their homes to help, and the, you know, the first, weeks of, first two weeks are the toughest part after joint replacement surgery. And um, as you're going to see now, because I'm going to stop talking and you're going to hear from a bunch of other people, this is a multidiscipline approach. Um, my job, my partner's job, is to sort of get you in to prepare you to do the surgery, but what we do is only part of it. We need a, we need a big team, and we have a great team. All right, so my name's Alicia Delpreet. I am the orthopedic nurse navigator for South Shore Hospitals. So I have been a nurse with the orthopedic team um, for 20 years now. So I started out as a bedside nurse on the orthopedic floor, and over the last few years, I transitioned into the nurse navigator role. So what does that really mean? I follow all of our joint replacements through the whole process of coming in and having uh, your surgery. I do all the pre-op education along with one of our members from the, uh, staff members from the rehab team. Um, I see patients at the hospital after surgery, kind of check in, see what's going on. I call patients after they get home to kind of check in, see how the first couple days are going at home. Um, and if we have patients that go to rehab facilities after surgery before returning home, I check in with them at the rehab. So I get to be close friends with everybody coming in to have joint replacements, and my job is I'm really here for our patients, and they can get a hold of me, and I can get a hold of them at any time. So what I'm going to share with you are is how to get ready for surgery, and then what are the first you know, couple days at the hospital like before you get it back into your home setting. So let me back up here. So this is our joint care team. So <laughs> It's like Dr. Ear said, it's not just him getting you through the surgery, it's everybody else after that that's taking care of you. So at the hospital, you have the anesthesiologist that's gonna put you to sleep for your surgery. We have medical hospitalists, so physicians and nurse practitioners that just work in the hospital that can care for our patients that have post-op issues or they, maybe they have diabetes and we just need to manage that a little bit more closely. So they're up on our floor. Uh, we have orthopedic uh, surgical nurses down in the OR that are or orthopedic specialized in helping do your case. Uh, we have myself that's an orthopedic nurse navigator and then uh, one of the nurses, Amy, who shares with me doing that. Uh, we have specially trained orthopedic nurses and nursing assistants up on the orthopedic floor, which is called Emerson 5. And then we have a core group of therapists that work at the hospital to take care of our patients afterwards. But we also have a group of therapists that work out in the community through our VNA service. Um, and then care co uh, progression coordinators, that's just now a fancy term for our case managers. They're the folks that set up that discharge planning, getting you to the next stop, making sure the referrals are sent. If you had any questions about your insurance, they're the people to ask. They can help order equipment if you need it. And then at the end, it's also you. So our patients are part of our care team. We want to make sure that you're on board with what we're doing. And it may be that you don't know what the plan is, but by coming to class and meeting with all of us, you will know what the plan is. And we look for your input to make sure that's the best plan for our patients going home. So this is me in this room during a class. Um, we offer classes twice a week. And um, like I said, myself and someone from the rehab team teaches it. And the purpose of the class is to just get patients and their family members ready for their surgery. So we walk you through all the pre-op appointments that you have to do in order to get ready to come in for surgery. We talk about the surg surgical uh, procedure. So I have some models that we kind of pass around, go through, I kind of walk through what the surgery is. But then we kind of focus on what are we going to do for those two to three days that you're at the hospital. So it's a quick stay these days. Oftentimes, it could, we now have patients going home after one night, but on average, it's after two nights at the hospital. So what are we going to do in that time frame to make sure that you are safe to return back into your home setting? So we focus a lot on that. Uh, we talk about what's going to happen when you leave the hospital and go home. Who's going to come out? What's going to go on there? And then when everybody's done with their home therapy, we want to get you to an outpatient PT clinic where you go somewhere a couple times a week to do some more physical therapy to really get the best result of coming in and having a joint emplacement. I always like to tell our patients, we can give you a new hip, a new knee, or a shoulder. 
But if you don't be very committed to the exercise program, you are not going to get a really good result of coming in and having the surgery. All right. Um, we do know that, you know, coming to class, hearing what to expect, knowing what's going to go on, it does decrease your anxiety. Coming in for any surgery, patients can be a little anxious. But as far as you know what's going on and how it's going to go, patients feel much more comfortable coming in. We start some pre-op exercises at class where we show you some exercises that we like patients to start doing before coming in. Um, and then we talk about how to prepare your home. So we ask, you know, what's your bathroom set up like? What's your kitchen set up like? How, how many stairs do you have to get into your house? We need to know all that. We want to be able to get you into your home safely and have you have a great outcome at being home. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that shows the more patients are prepared for surgery, the better outcomes they have. And that's why we do require that all of our patients come to this joint replacement class um, before coming in for surgery. All right. So um, what every patient gets usually in the office setting when they decide to have surgery is this nice green handbook. Um, and this kind of gets them ready and prepared for coming in for surgery. And we ask, ask them to read it before coming into the joint class. Um, there's some helpful information in that book to kind of fill out what things are like at home so that we can go over it at the class. Um, in that book, it has a lot of information about what is a joint replacement, so they can really refer to it. Um, what's the hospital stay going to be like? How do you live with your new joint replacement after you leave the hospital? How do you live with your new joint replacement a year from now, two years from now, ten years from now? So a lot of helpful information in there. Um, and a lot of this is discussed at class. Um, you know, that information in that book can be a little overwhelming for people um, when they're kind of nervous about coming in and trying to sit down and read that whole book at once. Um, sometimes you don't retain all that information, so it's good to come to the class as well. So this is what Emerson 5 looks like. This is our nurse's station as you get off the elevator. Our unit's a little over six years old. Um, with our unit, we have 26 private rooms on our floor, so the picture on your left is what your room looks like. They're almost as big as a double room, but it's just you in there. The picture on the right is what everybody's bathroom looks like. So big bathroom, you can walk in there with a walker. Um, nice big shower at the seat that comes down. We love to get our sh patients showered at the hospital before going home. Um, one less stressful thing to try to negotiate once you get home from the hospital. We also, that's just a picture of some patients walking down the hall after coming out of the gym. We also have this gym on the floor. So. This is where our patients will get down to the gym twice a day and do some exercising with the therapy staff. Looks like they're having a great time. They are. <laughs> it's, it's really a nice way to see for all the patients that they're all in the same boat. Some patients will come in thinking, geez, I'm so far behind, or you know, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? But we get all the patients down to the gym, put them through an exercise program, and they all see that they're in the same boat. And it's a nice way to kind of chit chat with other people um, that have had their joints replaced as well. So the hospital focus, so we get you through your surgery, but what are we gonna do afterwards? So we focus on early mobility, pain management, preventing post-op complications. So we want to prevent blood clots, we want to prevent infection, and we want to get your bowels moving and we want to make sure everybody's bladder is functioning fine. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of those and how um, we manage that. So mobility. Early assisted mobility optimizes your rehab, which means the sooner we can get you up after surgery, the more often we can get you up, the better prepared we are to get you back in your home setting. So really what does that mean? That means a couple hours after surgery, when you come up to Emerson 5 and your anesthesia has worn off, either your therapist or your nurse is coming in your room and saying, hey, let's get up and let's try walking around, okay? We're not looking to do anything fancy that afternoon besides walk you maybe to the bathroom, use the bathroom, come back and sit in the chair for a little bit. So it's really just kind of walking within your room, seeing what it feels like to be up on that new hip or that new knee. For patients who have shoulders, the same thing. We want to make sure their balance is intact, that they can get up and maneuver around. Um, so you are seen by PTOT, day of surgery. Um, if they don't get a chance to see you, say you come up later in the evening, then your nurse gets you up. So it's not, you don't wait till the next day. Someone's getting you up and moving you around. We ask that our patients sit in the chair for all their meals. We want everybody walking into the bathroom to use the bathroom. We really don't like bedpans and urinals. We want that practice of getting up and getting in. Um, you've seen by PT twice a day. You're seen by OT once a day. And then we'll get into detail what their focus is when they come in to work with you. And then I talked about those group exercise classes where you get down the gym in the afternoon and do some more therapy with other patients who had joints. 
So getting into how we manage pain. So we always say to everybody at the class and really stress it through the whole kind of continuum, you are gonna have pain after having a joint replacement surgery. It's just the nature of having a joint replacement that you're gonna be pretty uncomfortable for about that first two weeks that you're at home. So kind of setting that expectation ahead of time kind of prepares people. So they can't really come into the hospital and say, geez, I didn't know I wasn't gonna have any pain. We kind of have an expectation to expect pain, but we want that pain at an acceptable level where you can get up and participate in therapy. You can walk out in the hall with one of us. You can rest comfortably in your bed. You could sit comfortably in your chair and you could be functional. Would prefer for patients to remember their hospital stay and not have it be a total blur because the pain medication made them feel like it was a total blur, all right? So how do we treat your pain? We have standard pain protocols. We call it a multimodal approach where we give you different types of pain medication to help with your pain, all right? So one of those medications is narcotics, um, but narcotics have a lot of lousy side effects to them. They can be constipating, they can cause nausea, they can make people feel funny and kind of dizzy. Um, so we do give narcotics, but we also have extra strength Tylenol, we have anti-inflammatory medications that we give, um, and they come in both mostly pill form and some IV forms of medication. Um, we have an interarticular injection, which means it's a mixture of medication that gets injected either into the sh around the shoulder, around the hip, or around the knee. What that does is it helps provide pain relief for a bit of time after surgery. And the benefit of using that is so that we don't have to give you so many narcotics because narcotics have so many lousy side effects to them. So that's helpful. Um, repositioning, everybody gets stiff sitting in one position too long, so we have you moving around quite a bit. And then ice therapy is, is key. If I could call ice a pain medication, I would. I want patients to think of ice as part of their pain management. It helps with pain and it helps with post-op swelling that happens after surgery, okay? So preventing post-op complications. So pretty much your entire post-operative care is focused on preventing post-op complications, right? We wanna get you up and moving around. By moving around, it helps prevent the blood clots. It keeps your lungs nice and clear. It gets the bowels going. So a lot of good benefits to that. Preventing infection, we wanna prevent infections anywhere, all right? So anywhere in the body, not just your incision. So we give you some doses of IV antibiotics before you go into the operating room, after, the op uh, after your surgery. Incentive spirometer, that's a breathing tool that we have every puff, everybody puff on after surgery. We have a special surgical dressing that we put on um, you, over your incision to help prevent infection. That dressing stays on for one week and then comes off, so um, your incision's very protected. I always talk to patients about make sure your house is nice and clean. Maybe have someone change the sheets on your bed before you return home. Maybe vacuum your house up, dust your house up. Make sure that you're coming back to a clean environment. Um, oftentimes our patients have pets. Pets like to sniff and kind of lick wounds, right? So you always want to make sure that you stay clear of your animals and make sure they don't get too close to your incisions. Um, and preventing blood clots. We want to prevent blood clots after having a joint replacement surgery. So the sooner you get up, the more often you get up, the better we are at preventing blood clots. And we also put patients on a blood thinning medication for about six weeks after surgery. So we want to thin your blood just enough so you don't get a blood clot after having the surgery. So that's what we do with our patients to help prevent blood clots. So elimination. We just want to make sure that everybody starts peeing after surgery. We want people to start passing gas after surgery. Um, between the anesthesia and the narcotics, they can be very constipating. Sometimes people get nauseous from anesthesia and narcotics, so we want to make sure that we're controlling that. So again, we don't like to put catheters into people. We don't like patients using bedpans or urinals. We want you getting up into the bathroom and have it be more of a natural kind of occurrence. Um, we have standard bowel protocols where everybody goes on stool softeners and mild laxatives after surgery. Um, and then that early mobility really helps prevent um, that constipation. So, and we don't require that our patients move their bowels before they leave the hospital, but we wanna make sure we're heading in the right direction. And I always share with my patients, heading in the right direction means that you can eat without any nausea, you got good bowel sounds when we listen to your belly, and you're passing some good gas by the time you leave us, okay? Um, all right, so that's my section. I'm gonna pass it on to Pat, and he's gonna talk about the inpatient rehab side of things.
Good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Pat Garish. I'm a senior physical therapist uh, on our inpatient rehab team. Um, I've been working at the hospital for about 10 years now, primarily on our orthopedic um, floor. So I'll be talking to you a little bit about what you can expect um, from a rehab standpoint while you're in the hospital, kind of who we are, um, and get into kind of that continuum, like Alicia mentioned, of um, that timeline for therapy, okay? <clears throat> So while you're at the hospital, uh, what we're really looking to start doing is improving your function uh, so you can safely get back home. Um, and by that, we're going to start working on your range of motion um, and on strengthening the muscles that surround that new joint that you've had uh, replaced, okay? Um, with the visiting nurses, you'll generally start that um, service up at the three-day marker once you get home. Um, and, and what you're doing with them is continuing what we started in the hospital. Um, and progressing you so you can safely get back out into the community. Uh, from there, you'll be moving to your outpatient therapy. That's going to be your longest stop along the way. It's roughly at about the three-week mark, um, and you'll be working with outpatient therapy um, you know, up until potentially three or four months or so post-op. Okay? Um, and really the role and goal of outpatient therapy is to fine-tune and maximize uh, the strength of the muscles around that joint um, and the range of motion to try and restore that as close to your norms as possible um, and get you back to either work or hobby, whichever it is that you're really looking to pursue. Okay. <clears throat> so our rehab team with physical therapy while you're in the hospital, what we're looking to start doing is initiate your out-of-bed activities. Uh, we'll work on restoring your normal gait pattern, which is your walking pattern. Uh, we'll work on strengthening up your lower extremity, um, restoring that range of motion like I just mentioned, stairs, balance. That all kind of falls under the realm of uh, what we do. Um, with occupational therapy, so the difference between PT and OT really is that um, where PT focuses more on that mobility, strength, range of motion, OT incorporates that more into your activities of daily living. So your um, your bathing, your dressing, your toileting. Um, after any type of uh, uh, lower extremity surgery um, or an upper extremity in the case of a shoulder, you know it's going to definitely be more difficult to manage um, those day-to-day -day activities. So they'll, just, they'll show you safe strategies. Um, they might show you some equipment that can help you stay independent. Um, those are the types of things that they really kind of specialize in. Um, and like Alicia mentioned too, we like to have them work on um, that first shower with you while you're in the hospital with us, um, especially you know, in the case if you do have a hip replacement, there may be some precautions to follow. Uh, they want to make sure that you're staying safe with that type of um, activity. Okay. <clears throat> and then in terms of discharge planning, so that really starts as soon as you um, start up the pre-op process with your orthopedic surgeon. You know, it starts in the office. We continue to progress with that um, at the total joint class. Um, and, you know, it continues once you're in the hospital. And more importantly, you know, you're um, the most important team uh, member of that, okay? Um, when you are in the hospital, the case manager will take all of the discharge recommendations uh, from the rehab staff, you know, the nurses, the docs, um, and work on getting the safest discharge plan for you. Um, you know, as we mentioned before, 80% um, of our patients do go home. Um, we want to make sure that you're safe doing so. So a lot of times they'll set up that um, referral to the VNA. If needed, they'll set up a, a referral to um, a skilled nursing facility. Um, and they can also kind of help order equipment or answer any questions about your insurance um, that you may have. They're pretty much the experts on that, okay? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Erin from the VNA. Hello, my name is Erin Gill. I'm a physical therapist with South Shore B VNA. I've been with the organization for almost six years. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about our um, aspect of care during your recovery. So what will happen is when you are discharged home from the hospital or from um, a skilled nursing facility after your total joint replacement, you will be admitted to our agency. Um, and what will happen is the nurse will come out and be the first person that meets you and then you will also be seen by the physical therapist and the occupational therapist. We will come to your house. Um, the team includes nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and a home health aide. A home health aid um, is a service that we offer when it is deemed that a patient needs extra help with um, bathing, dressing, things of that nature. 
Not everyone has a home health aid, but it's something that will determine when we first meet you, make sure that you have everything you need in the house to do those things safely. So the home care team works closely with the discharge team from the acute hospital or the skilled nursing facility. We get all of the information. We know exactly where you're at when you're discharged to home and we'll be able to pick up and run with that and get you um, onto the next level. The home visits start the day after you are discharged from the hospital and safety is the key. What we're gonna do from that first visit is assess your home, assess how you're moving in your home and make sure that everything is set up for you the best way that it can be. I think that Dr. Ayers mentioned that the first two weeks after a surgery is um, really the most difficult. I can agree with that in observing the patients in the home environment. And then Alicia mentioned that exercises are one of the most important things for your recovery. So what becomes a little bit complicated is the first two weeks when you're not feeling good, the therapists are gonna be coming and making you do your exercises. So if you can just hang in there with us for those first two weeks, I promise things get better and you will start to see some good results. So with regards to a total knee replacement, it's eight to 10 visits by the physical therapist over your first three weeks at home. And really, again, the goal is to make sure that patients are safe in the house. Are you able to get up and down the stairs? Are you able to get in and out of your bed? Are you able to walk safely? Are you able to get in and out of the house, in and out of the car, and really do everything that you need to do in your home environment? We are going to progress the exercises that you started in the hospital. Um, our goal is to make sure that you increase the range of motion and the strength of that knee. With the total hip replacement, it's about seven visits by the PT, and you may or may not be followed by the occupational therapist if, if needed over about four weeks. So again, just to clarify with the occupational therapist, if we find that you are needing some instruction, especially with the safety regarding taking care of yourself, um, getting washed, getting dressed, preparing your own meal, then we would um, make sure that an OT came out to the house to make sure you could do that in the home environment. Again, the goals for the total hip replacement are very similar to the knee. We need to make sure that you're moving safely in the house. We need to make sure that you're maintaining your precautions. Sometimes with a total hip replacement, you are sent home with a set of instructions as far as what motions to avoid for a certain period of time. So we'll make sure that, you know, things like getting in and out of the bed, you're not um, gonna put yourself in any danger of breaking those precautions. Um, the total shoulder replacement, six visits by the OT over two weeks. So typically you, um, are followed by the OT and not the PT in the setting of the home. But what they are gonna do very similarly, they're gonna make sure that you're safe in the house, you're gonna have a sling, they're gonna make sure that that is positioned properly and that you're using that effectively. They're gonna assist with the showering and the dressing, making sure that you can do those things on your own. And they're also gonna help you with some gentle exercises. And then you're gonna go to outpatient therapy. everyone. My name is Lina Lamb. I'm a, a physical therapy specialist and I work right down the hall in the clinic here. Um, so at this stage in the game, you're on your last journey through this, uh, your last step on this journey and you come to outpatient therapy. Um, so as we said earlier, um, shoulders typically come to outpatient therapy about two weeks, knees about three weeks, and hips about five to six weeks, sometimes earlier, sometimes later, depending on the patient. Now, this, while this may seem like a, a, sh a long time, we ask you to start thinking about where you're gonna receive your outpatient therapy right before the hospital, before the surgery happens. So um, we ask you to decide on where you're gonna have that outpatient that outpatient therapy before you have the surgery so that everything is prepared. If you have your, if you decide to have your therapy here, either here and we'll talk about the facilities, Alicia will actually set up those appointments for you and, and get you going with the initial evaluation and the first visit <coughs> before you leave the hospital, which is a really nice bonus. So as I mentioned, we have two facilities for South Shore Hospital. At the main hospital at 55 Fog Road, there's the outpatient rehab center. It's got a nice gym there, and what they also and um, uh, specialists who work with orthopedics there. 
and they also have a pool, also known as the um, best kept secret on the South Shore, the, the pool at the main campus, okay? Well, some people find it very helpful to integrate aquatic therapy along with their land-based therapy, and that's allowed pretty much once the incision is completely healed and you get the okay from the physician. Also, as I mentioned right down the hall where I work, uh, we have this uh, orthopedic spine sports medicine uh, clinic here. Um, nice bright space um, employed by therapists who focus on orthopedic care. So how do we progress your treatment through this last leg of the journey? Well, we don't just sit up at night thinking of things, ways to torture you, as some people may think. It's actually based on research that shows us the best evidence of what we can do to get you better faster. That's our goal, to get you better efficiently, safely, and fastly. So with that in mind, what do you expect to achieve by the time you're done with outpatient therapy? Well, you may not be 100%, we're really looking for 75 to 80% of the way there, okay? Um, we wanna make sure you have your maximum range of motion is achieved, your strength is achieved, that you're getting around your house well, you're walking, you're able to go up and down stairs, you can reach for things if it's the shoulder. And then also, it varies from patient to patient based on what your goals are. Do you wanna go back to golf? Do you wanna go back to gardening? Or if, yeah, other hobbies and things like that. And after that, there's life after outpatient therapy. Who knew? And otherwise known as life. So the most important thing that I try to relay to patients is that you will be happier with your joint replacement the stronger you are. And so that involves a continuous ex continuing with your home exercise program onward. There's no end date to that. You'll be happier the stronger you are moving forward. So some people, different people approach that in different ways. Some people are extremely regimented. They get up at 4.30 every morning, they do their exercises, and they're, they're good to go. Some people need a little bit more assistance, and they're looking for some programs to get into. So South Shore Hospital does offer a community exercise program over in Performance Drive in Weymouth, and where they actually have classes run for people after joint replacements. And some people really like that transition to kind of continue the regimen and the routine and to make sure that they continue with, the, with their exercises. And a lot of people enjoy the camaraderie that they find there as well. Um, thank you very much for coming today.